A lot of people say the world is getting smaller. Well, for Ryan Campbell, it's about to get a whole lot bigger. At the end of the month, the 19-year-old will take off from our coast and attempt a record-breaking journey in a tiny plane. It was a world record breaking adventure as I become the youngest person to have ever flown a single engine aeroplane solo around the world. As humans, we're wired to learn the majority of our life lessons, not from the good times, although they're very enjoyable, but from the bad times. Not long after that, I was in Spinal Ward. In a very split second moment, my life was about to change. The runway disappeared below me, the engine stopped. Three seconds later, with trees below us, what resulted was a massive, massive accident. Somehow, I survived. Little did I know the journey I was beginning would teach me more than I ever, ever could have imagined. Every challenge is an opportunity to quit. But every challenge is also an opportunity to adapt. I am lucky to be a paraplegic. Never did I think I would say those words, let alone say them on a stage in the United States of America, 11,000 miles from home. Today, I want to share with you my most powerful tools, tools that honestly saved me. A systematic approach to conquering adversity, be it to achieve greatly or climb back from unimaginable depths. Let's dive in. By working through my doubts and insecurities, I discovered where I was most likely to give up. What I found and identified were my quitting triggers. Every eight-year-old boy or girl has a dream. Yet so few of us ever follow through with it. For me, it wasn't achieving my dream of flying around the world that made me who I am. It was losing everything and having to fight back as if my life depended on it. And frankly, it did. We were all built to fly. Some in planes, some in business, and some in our communities. We must refuse to accept defeat when adversity strikes. Now instead, this is our time to rise. It is our time to fire up the engine. It is our time to push forward that throttle as we look into the sky. Right now, it's our time to soar. People often ask how old I am. I always tell them that my birth certificate's 25, but my uh, mind's 65 and it'd be plain rude to ask how old my body is. But that's, that's the cost of living the life that I've lived. I can say in the last 10 years, I've uh, experienced the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. From shaking hands with a prince to scribbling my name in the front cover of my own book at age 20, to then having a sponge bath with a couple of good looking Aussie nurses in a spinal rehabilitation ward become a daily ritual. But I think I'm lucky, you see, because although I've lost out physically, I've gained up here in ways that I never ever could have imagined. And to me, that's the most amazing gift I've ever been given. At six years old, I hopped on an aeroplane and I flew out to an island in the Pacific with my family. That day, I discovered a passion. My passion was flying. At age 14, I took a job after school and on the weekends, and I decided that I'd learn to fly. So I saved up my pennies, and once every two weeks, I'd take an hour's flying lesson. On my 15th birthday, I hopped in the aeroplane, took off completely by myself, and flew solo for the very first time. At age 16, I was given an add-on to my license that allowed me to take family and friends flying in a local area. The problem was, I was 16 and all my school friends were 17. That meant they had a driver's license, I didn't. So we had a deal. The deal was that if they would drive me from school to the airport, I'd take them flying, but they had to drop me back home. <laughs> at age 17, I passed my private pilot's license, but at the same time, I took on another idea, something that was a little bit bigger than anything I'd ever attempted before. I was 17. I sat down and Googled how to fly solo around the world. 
I found a website called How to Fly Solo Around the World, <laughs> earthrounders.com. I read that website over and over again. I printed off all the information, I highlighted all the important parts, and I put it in a drawer and hid it in my desk. You see, I didn't want my mum and dad to find it. I didn't want anyone to think that I was crazy enough to want to achieve something so big. Once I googled all there was to Google, I still found I had this burning desire inside of me to keep going with this. This was an age-related record to fly solo around the world, so I couldn't just sit and do nothing. So I decided I'd contact an Australian entrepreneur, businessman, and five-time around-the-world pilot. He was a very, very famous household name by the name of Dick Smith. So at 17, how do you contact someone so famous? Well, I was 17. I googled it. I googled, and he hates me telling anyone this, especially in Australia, I googled Dick Smith's email address. I found five, and I sent an email to all five. Dear Dick, my name is Ryan Campbell. I have 200 flying hours, and I want to fly solo around the world. I read that email now, and I cringe. But somehow, I received a reply. Now, Dick wrote me an email back, and he said, well, he said it's expensive. He said it's dangerous. He said it's never been done before. But all of that was irrelevant because right at the bottom was a little line that said, but it can be done. Now, what Dick said to me was, if you can find a mentor that will back you up tell, to tell me that you are the guy to do the job safely, then I'll support you. So again, lazy teenager, I took the same Dear Dick email, crossed out Dear Dick, wrote Dear Ken, and sent it to a guy called Ken. <laughs> now, Ken, he'd flown around the world in 2008. He was a family man, he had three young boys. And I went straight to Ken and said, hey, Ken, this is what I want to do. What do you think? Ken come back and said, absolutely. For a couple of weeks, we emailed. For a couple of weeks, those emails were printed off and hidden in that desk. But by the end of it, he agreed to be my mentor. But then the best part, I went back to Dick Smith and he didn't expect that, I can promise you. Dear Dick, remember me, I'd like you to meet Ken. Ken's my mentor. Dick then supported me. All of a sudden, my team of one had become a team of three. The problem with that is nobody else knew. That's why it was a team of three. It was myself, Dick and Ken. Now, when I say no one else knew, I mean no one else knew, including my parents. That's a problem. So what I did one day, I washed the dishes and I dried the dishes, which I think helped. <laughs> I looked at my dad and I said, hey dad, what would you say if I said that I thought maybe I might want to fly around the world and be the youngest person to have ever done so? Dad looked straight at me and he went, yeah, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> I then looked at my mom. My mom's a text me when you get there, mom. If you don't text my mum when you get there, at your predetermined ETA, you will receive a phone call five minutes later. She will request a status update. So this conversation of can I fly solo around the world could have gone either way, to, to put it bluntly. I looked at my mum and I said, hey mum, what would you think if I said that I wanted to fly around the world? Her response, you'd see some amazing things. See, that's the difference between a supportive parent and a non-supportive parent. They didn't think that I would do this. I was a dreamer. I was the kid who always come up with these wild ideas. They were literally just being supportive. Until I sat down at the kitchen table and handed them a folder. <laughs> and in that folder were a, a selection of color-coded emails, all put in chronological order. This was the most streamlined presentation I'd ever done in my life. And I wanted it to go smoothly as possible. I slid it under mum and dad's nose. They took one look at it and they looked at me. And you've got to realize that Dick Smith was a household name that they grew up with. And all of a sudden, they were reading emails from him to their son. All of a sudden, it became very real. Within moments, the team of three had become a team of five. That's the power of a naive teenager. A lot of people ask me whether the round the world flight chapter of my life helped me through the spinal cord injury chapter. Well, the short answer is yes. I want to talk to you about how so, but first, let's jump in the world flight aircraft. I want you to see the top three landings from that circumnavigation. Extra minutes. Victor Hotel Oscar Lima Sierra is now in a right south for one nine. Victor Hotel Oscar Lima Sierra is one south one nine. Clear to land. Traffic will be departing prior to your arrival. Clear to land. Uh, runway one nine and copy traffic. Victor Hotel Oscar Lima Sierra.
See, I think of all the little life lessons that I've learnt along the way as tools. Some we use every day and some hardly at all, but they're all important. See, I believe when we start life, we're all given a toolbox, a big one. It's really big. It's got heaps of drawers. It's got wheels. We can tow it with us wherever we go. The aim of life is to discover, pick up, and learn to use all sorts of tools to better your life, to grow, to achieve, and to overcome. Not only do we need to continually find new tools, we need to learn how to use them, when to use them, when not to use them, and how to keep them sharp. See, perspective, learnt from Ben, is a tool that I use almost every single day. Here's another. At 17, I was asked to fly a friend up the coast of Australia in his own aeroplane. See, I had the pilot's license, he had the aeroplane. Andrew was a normal guy, married with two kids. We hopped in the aeroplane and we took off and headed north. That night, we landed in Brisbane. We went to his unit, we had dinner, and we went out onto the deck and we sat there and we had a chat and a drink. In my hand, I held a book of Charles Lindbergh's story, one of the greatest aviation pioneers that ever lived. We talked about how amazed I was by these people who lived such a phenomenal life so early in the world of aviation. I told Andrew that I'd love to follow in their footsteps and do something crazy, something bold. I'd love to live like they lived. Andrew and I discussed this. We started to talk about ways that we could emulate that, that pioneering spirit. I very casually and very quietly mentioned to Andrew that I thought that maybe flying a plane around the world, breaking a record, one that still stood, may have been a possibility. See, back in 2008, the world record of the youngest person to circumnavigate the globe solo in a single engine was 37 years old. It then went back to 23 in 2008. And I sat there at 17, not very good at math, and thought, I can do that. Andrew said to me, in a, with a very straight face, he said, well, why don't you fly around the world? I was a little taken back. His seeming ignorance to just how hard that would be really got to me. And I was 17, and I knew everything. Andrew sat quietly as I explained a list of reasons why I couldn't fly around the world. Now, I can call them reasons, or I can call them excuses. I didn't have the money. I didn't have the experience. I didn't know how to fly around the world. I listed a very impressive list. Andrew sat very quietly, and then it was his turn. He smiled at me. He was about to teach a 17-year-old kid a lesson. He went on to list the next step for every single one of my excuses in order. I don't have enough money. Well, Andrew explained, as an engineer and a businessman, the art of corporate sponsorship. He told me all about how we could go and create a very enticing little adventure and we could then get companies, big and small, to jump on board with us financially in return for exposure. I didn't have the experience to fly around the world, I said. Well, Andrew said to me, what about a mentor? He went on to explain to a 17-year-old kid the importance of acknowledging what you don't know, the importance of finding people who have that experience and learning from them. Every single thing that I listed as an excuse, Andrew provided a next step. Even more powerful was that he provided the next step, not the solution. Andrew didn't turn around and give me a blank check and say, hey, fund the world flight. If he had have done that, I promise you, it would never, ever have been a success. He made me work for it. Excuses, ready? Write this down. Excuses are lethal. We naturally develop excuses as humans to justify why we haven't achieved. We do it every day. Realising that we don't always need a solution, but merely the next step can make a daunting mountain climbable. The next step leaves your excuses void, because now it is an excuse. There's actually work to be done. That's in my toolbox. As is the power of a mentor. Your ability to acknowledge the experience and wisdom of those around you will allow you to transform and grow, as, just importantly, will acknowledging what you don't know. Now, during my spinal recovery, years later, I was invited to attend Back on Track, a three-day retreat dedicated to helping severely injured participants find a new pathway forward. The retreat was held at a beachside disability resort in Sydney. 
overlooking golden sand, a big ocean pool and beautiful blue water with waves. One day at lunch, I mentioned how badly I wanted to go for a swim. One of the guys looked up to me and he said, hey, let's go then. Here's the problem. With my spinal cord injury, I don't have any glute muscles. I don't have any calf muscles. I do, but they're not connected, so they don't do anything. I don't have any push in my feet or any stability in my feet. And what that means is when I move, I move slowly and I tire easily. What Eric wanted to do, this gentleman recommending we go for a swim, the Paralympic rower, what he wanted to do was go down to the ocean pool, which had a disability ramp, accessibility ramp, and a set of stairs. He wanted to go for a swim, make it back up to class, get dry, get dressed, and get back into the room, literally in 40 minutes. I couldn't do that. But you see, there was a problem. Eric was in a wheelchair. If you have legs that work in any, any state whatsoever, you do not get to say no to a guy in a wheelchair. <laughs> so before I knew it, I had a towel over my shoulder and I was following Eric out the door. We went all the way down to the ocean pool and we found a little problem. See, the tide was out, so there was no water in the ocean pool. I was pretty happy. I was like, well, that's a shame, isn't it? I said, at least we tried. We better go back to class. Eric looked at me and he went, well, how about we just go for a swim in the ocean? There was a problem with that, and that was the sand. See, I struggled to walk around on solid ground, let alone sand. I'd grown up at the beach, and it was very, very hard for me to now cross this soft, uneven surface. But when a guy in a wheelchair looks at you and he says that we're going to go for a swim, again, you say, yes, absolutely. What stairs do you want to take? I'll take these ones with the handrail. And I said to Eric, let's go. Absolutely. I didn't want to do it. I climbed down this set of stairs with the handrail and Eric said, I'm going to take that set of stairs over there. I said, can I help you? And he went, no, nah, I'm right. So I went down the stairs and I started across the sand and I wobbled and I moved. I looked like I would had way too many beers. The problem was yet another problem. Halfway between the stairs and the water were two really good looking Aussie girls <laughs> laid out on the beach getting a tan. Now, I wasn't very confident as it was, but I sure as eggs didn't want to walk past them, make eye contact, wobbling like I am. So I went around. When I got to the hard packed sand, I turned around and looked back and I thought, I wonder where Eric is. Feeling bad, I didn't help him, even though I had my own issues. What I saw at the top of the stairs was an empty wheelchair. And I kid you not, I looked down to the sand and I saw a smooth trail through the sand that approached me. And at the end of the smooth trail was a body laying face down in the sand doing this. And he was making his way to the water. I thought that was amazing. But what really made me sick as he went straight past those two good looking girls, already at their level, stopped, looked across, smiled, said good day, and kept going. <laughs> made me sick. Confidence level made me sick. <laughs> We jumped in the water and we went for a swim and I hate to say it, but we made it back up and we got dry and we ended up at class within our 40 minute window. In a split second that day, I learnt more about living with a disability and the power of the mind and what I would do during that entire three day retreat. You see, like Alan had suggested to me years before, Eric had made a yes and no decision right when we discussed going for a swim. He said yes. And now that he said yes, there was nothing that was going to stop him making that a reality. I, however, was looking for every opportunity to quit, to go back to class, to stay dry. Crazy, considering that the swim was my idea. You see, every challenge is an opportunity to quit. But every challenge is also an opportunity to adapt. Eric chose to adapt. He owned his situation, acknowledged his limitations, and was proud of his ability to adapt and overcome. Both Alan and Eric proved to me the importance of not quitting, be it in a moment as big as taking on a world first or simply going for a swim. See, by working through my doubts and insecurities, I discovered where I was most likely to give up. What I found and identified were my quitting triggers. This might sound foreign, but there's nothing wrong with foreign, I can tell you. I challenge you to dig deep, take a pen, take a piece of paper, and think of all the times you have said no and given up. Ask yourself why you gave up. Discover what gets in your way when striving to achieve. 
find your top 10 quitting triggers and learn them. See, by identifying these triggers in advance, we can watch out for them. And when they emerge, we'll know they are nothing but imposters trying to rob us of our dreams. If we can spot them in advance and see them for what they really are, then we can avoid them. Now, you might think this sounds complicated, but trust me when I tell you that this way of thinking can become second nature. Here's how I can prove that. I contacted Eric. I said, hey, Eric, I live in America now. He said, cool. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm speaking. I said, can I, can I share the story of that time we went for a swim at the back on track camp? He went, sure, okay. I said, mate, I said, that really affected me. I said, I can't tell you what a big impact that had on my life. Seeing how you went beyond all obstacles and you still went for a swim. I said, I mean, that guy really wanted to go for a swim that day. You know what he said to me? Lol. Mate, I can't believe that me dragging my ass across that sand had such a big effect on you. That's how I knew that that was second nature for Eric. He said yes, he overcome his quitting triggers and he had a swim that day. And I will never ever forget that. That's a tool and that's in my toolbox.